years ago reading a story about this. I wasn't there, so I didn't get to participate in it. I'm kind of glad I didn't, but it was one of those church get-togethers where they uh, honor husbands and wives and relationships and things like that, kind of like we have our sweethearts banquet here. Any of you remember the year we did the sweethearts banquet in the game that night? Brian had all the ladies, he had the men blindfolded, and the ladies were supposed to feel our faces and tell who, who we were. Any of you remember that? So we guys are standing there blindfolded, and the ladies are all walking down the line feeling of our faces trying to guess who we are, and they're our wives. And, uh, of course, they missed half of us, which was kind of embarrassing. And we guys, you know, thought that was kind of funny until we took the blindfold off and looked at each other and realized that all the ladies had face paint on their fingers. And our faces were all blackened. Yeah. And we, we appreciate Brian for that. We really do. But th this one was a similar type game. But what they did is they had a sheet... And all of the ladies went behind that sheet and had to take off their shoes and, stop and socks and just stick their toes out from under. And the guys had to go along and identify their wife based upon their toes. And doesn't that sound like fun? You know, uh, and, and I would like to think I could recognize my wife based upon her toes, but it helps if I've got from head to toe, because then I can recognize her, if I can see her over the other people, because she's a little on the uh, elevation challenged side of things. But anyway, I'm not, I didn't say you're short, babe. I really didn't. I didn't say that. Vertically challenged, that was it. But anyway, when we go out into the world as individuals, the world sees like little parts of the body. Of Christ. It's like they see the toes. But when we come together here, we are the body of Christ. And when we come together on Sunday mornings to worship and to study and learn, we are to be learning what Christ intends His body to look like in this world. And I wanted to share that with us this morning because... On Sunday mornings, we are looking through uh, the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus is giving an idea or give, setting the, the example. This is what the kingdom of heaven is to look like on earth as it is in heaven. This is what God's people are to look like. And so we learn about how we are to be as a church, but then we leave here today and we go out into the world. And that's when it becomes somewhat more of a challenge. I don't have a problem keeping control of my thoughts and, and my words and everything here. But I do when I get out there. We talked a little about this last week. And that's why it's so important on Wednesday nights when we come together and we talk about how do we put these things into practice. This, this morning we're going to be talking uh, about some, some kind of difficult things. Things that our society does not support. In fact, our society does everything they can to, to uh, distract us from it and to tell us that there's something different. And so it's a question of, you know, how do we learn to, to be filled with God so much that we do what He wants us to? And that's kind of what our Wednesday nights are about. And I wanted to kind of give an illustration of this. I've got here a glove. And... This glove, I can, from the outside, I can move the fingers around, but I can only do it to a limited amount. But if I put my hand inside this glove, and I don't want to hear any comments about if the glove fits, but anyway, when it's filled from the inside, I can do all kinds of neat things with that glove that I can't do from the outside. Jesus is talking here in the Sermon on the Mount about His people needing to be filled with or captivated by the will of God so that it's not just the external influences that affect how you do things, but it comes from inside. God wants us to be motivated from the inside. He wants to, us to be filled with Him so much from the inside that our core character represents Him. 
And so Jesus in his teaching on the Sermon on the Mount brings up a lot of these things because the Pharisees and the teachers of the law had this down where, you know, you could be influenced by their laws. You know, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this. But it didn't do anything to change the character of who the person was inside. Jesus says, God gave that law, but He wants something deeper from it. He wants you to be changed from the inside out. He wants you to be captivated by the will of God. Because you, Jesus said, are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Your righteousness must surpass that of the Pharisees. You guys have to take it to a much deeper level. And we started looking last week at some of Jesus' teachings on this, and we're going to continue on. Uh, if you haven't done so already, open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to continue on in verse 27, page 684 in your pew Bible. And this morning we're going to be talking about two, we're going to be talking about three different topics, but two of them I, I know are everyone's favorites. We love talking about these things. But in Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 27, it says, You have heard that it was said, Do not commit adultery. But I tell you that everyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for the whole body to go into hell. Now, in the Old Testament, adultery was understood as sexual relations between a man, whether married or single, and another man's wife or a virgin who was betrothed or pledged to be married to another man. Now the primary concern in the Old Testament was a violation or a defiling of another man's wife. That was the core issue. And, and this, in the Ten Commandments, uh, thou shalt not commit adultery is in there, but it also says in there that you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. Because it all begins with coveting. You see, like one scholar said, uh, if you covet anything of your neighbors, your house, his manservant, maidservant, ox, donkey, that's viewed as a serious breach in the covenantal relationship and becomes a gateway for violating every other principle of the Ten Commandments. Once we begin looking and longing for other things, and that's what Jesus says here, he says it all starts with a look. But Jesus is not saying, uh, that, you know, just a glance at a woman and noticing a woman that is beautiful. That's not where the sin is. In fact, in verse 27, he uses the phrase, looks at a woman lustfully. This is, like I say, not just noticing, but it's the kind of look that results in another person's spouse becoming the object of of our sexual desires. It's taking it to a deeper, deeper level. It's not just looking and saying, wow, that's an attractive woman, but it's saying, wow, that's an attractive woman. I wonder, I would like to. See, Jesus goes on here and He charges His disciples with the responsibility not to take that look. But it's more than just turning the head and looking the other direction. Jesus is calling His disciples to be captivated by the will of God and therefore He places this emphasis on the heart, not just on the outside act. It's not just about not looking. He says, he says don't, don't take that look, that lustful look, but He also goes on and says, don't even think those lustful thoughts. <coughs> And he uses these hyperbolic illustrations here to show the radical measures 
that people need to go to, to to keep from having these illicit desires. He says, and these aren't making men, meant to be taken literally. He says, you know, if your eye offends you, pluck your eye out. If your right hand offends you, cut your right hand off. But he doesn't mean that literally because Jesus is addressing the heart. And even with only one eye, you can still have lustful thoughts, right? All right, it's not that difficult. Even with only one hand, you can still have lustful thoughts, right? That would be like Bragging saying, I have lustful thoughts with one hand tied behind my back. And so Jesus isn't indicating, you know, this is the way to cure your problems. But what He's emphasizing here is these are important things. Cherished things. How many of you like having your eyesight? Yeah, it's kind of nice, isn't it? How many of you like having a right hand? It's kind of hard to clap without it, isn't it? You know, there's a lot of things you can't do when you when you don't have a right hand. I told you guys how uh, back in the olden days I had a ponytail. Well, I broke my left collarbone one time, and so my my uh, arm was in a sling like that. Have you ever tried to put your hair into a ponytail with just one hand? It's kind of tough. It, isn't it, Caitlin? It's kind of tough, yeah. There's a lot of things that we need both hands for. What Jesus is emphasizing here is there are things to you that are cherished, important. You might even think they're vital to you. But if you aren't willing to give those things up to keep from having these kind of sexual, illicit desires, you may find yourself in hell. Now that's pretty blunt, isn't it? Jesus takes this thing to, to a whole deeper level. Last week we looked at uh, Jesus' teaching on relationships. And Jesus teaches the disciples that it's your responsibility to go out there and, and fix the relationships that, that are broken in your life. You are to take the initiative. Well, here he says, it's your responsibility, men. And he does address this to the men. Now, I think it's applicable to women today, especially in our society. But Jesus says in this passage, it is your responsibility, men, not to look lustfully. And he doesn't seem to make any concession about in, any inner motivations or any external causes. He calls his hearers to radical, responsible initiative. This is something that comes from within you. And I want to talk just a moment about two of those things that I emphasized just a second ago. First of all, Jesus makes no concession to inner motivations. Now in our society, people uh, like to be able to try it before you buy it. How many of you, when you go to an ice cream shop, you'll say, can I have a taste of that? Yeah, because we don't want to pay for it till we get a taste of it, right? You go to a car dealership. How many of you like to test drive your car before you buy it? Yeah. You go to a shoe store. How many of you like to put a pair of shoes on before you buy them? Right? Okay, we, that's our society. But our society is taking that further than said to the point where we say, you know, you need to try out the sex with this person before you marry them. And God doesn't say in His will, He doesn't say, you know, it's okay. I know you guys just want to see if it's going to work. I, I love it when I'll ask couples, you know, who I'll say, are you guys having sex? You know, they come to me for premarital counseling. And they'll say, yeah. I'll say, why are you having sex? We want to know if it'll work. I say, I can trust you. It will. Okay? <laughs> trust me on that. It will work. But we also, you know get this idea that, that God says, well, you're engaged, so it's okay. But that's not what He says. He doesn't say, you know, as long as you guys are thinking that maybe this might you know, be okay in the future, that's okay. That's not what God's will says. God's will says that it's for one man and one woman in marriage. That's what it's intended for. 
And so Jesus here doesn't make any concessions for inner motivations. But not only that, he makes no concessions for external causes. We have rabbinic writings from Jesus' time period which, which indicates that in Jesus' time period, the Jewish way of thinking for many people was that guys, don't, guys aren't the ones responsible for lustful thoughts in illicit sexual activities. It's all caused because of women and the way that they dressed and the way they presented themselves. Now, I read that and I thought, well, that's really pretty offensive. It makes it sound like men are just kind of mindless adults who just kind of follow along whatever's out there in front of them. And that bothered me until I realized most men aren't just kind of mindless adults who <laughs> whatever's out there. But, but the only way to prevent this is to take women and keep them in seclusion or to keep them covered from head to feet so that you can't see them and therefore the men aren't lusting after them. This is something that still goes on in some cultures in our world today and you know the ones I'm talking about. But notice Jesus doesn't put any of the responsibility here on the women. Men, don't look lustfully after a woman. And you can't say, well did you see what she was wearing? Because that's not the responsibility here. You see, we are to be totally different from the rest of the world. This goes much deeper. It goes to the heart of God's, of God's intent more than just merely keeping the surface legalities of things. The old saying, you know, you can look at the menu, you just can't place an order. That doesn't go anymore. You can't look at the menu. You can't even think about placing an order. Because if you do, Jesus says you may find yourself condemned to the fires of hell. Pretty serious stuff. And then he goes on into something else. Uh, verse 31 he says, it has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for marital unfaithfulness, causes her to commit adultery. And anyone who marries a woman so divorced commits adultery. Now, this language about a certificate of divorce comes from Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 1 through 4. And, and I'm, we're going to read through them here. If you want to write this down and go back and look it up later on your own, you're welcome to do that. But Deuteronomy 24, verses 1 through 4 says, If a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her, and sends her from his house, and if after she leaves his house she becomes the wife of another man, and her second husband dislikes her and writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her and sends her from his house, or if he dies, then her first husband who divorced her is not allowed to marry her again after she has been defiled. That would be detestable in the eyes of the Lord. Do not bring sin upon the land the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. <coughs> now, a couple of things I want us to, to notice about that passage in Deuteronomy chapter 24. First of all, it does not legitimize divorce. The, the whole passage is not about what makes divorce legal. The, the whole passage is really about providing legal protection to this woman who is being passed around from man to man to man. And it goes back to saying that, that if once a guy's put a woman out and then she has been defiled by another man, if her first guy takes her back, that just adds to the defilement. But nowhere does it legitimize divorce and say that it's okay. Now the Jews had misinterpreted this as if it did legitimize divorce. It made it okay. But their focus then became... Well, if it legitimizes divorce, then when is divorce acceptable? Which is kind of where the question always comes along. And their focus was on verse 1, where it says that if a woman becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her. How do you define indecent? How do you define displeasing? What do you mean by is? Is kind of... Anyway... 
There's two schools of thoughts in Jesus' time. The first is from a guy named Shammai. He was a rabbi, and he said that this had to be something immoral or it had to do with sexual immorality. That was his understanding of it. The only time divorce is allowed. Immorality, sexual immorality. That wasn't real popular. It's like it's not in our society today. And so you had another thought, a guy named Hillel, who said, well, anything that displeases him, such as, I mean, even if she burns his toast, good enough reason. Another rabbi that came around about that same time named Rabbi Akiba, uh, he said that, that the phrase, she finds no favor in his eyes, meant that she wasn't attracted to him anymore. In fact, he was attracted to someone else, and that was grounds for divorce. Of these two... Uh, schools of thought, which one do you think was the most popular? The second one, by Hillel. In our world today, which one do you think is most popular? The second one. Whatever makes you feel good. Whatever you like. That's fine. But Jesus here, in His teaching, is driving home the point of the fact that these frivolous divorces that are initiated by these men, and in those days men were the ones who initiated the divorces, but these frivolous divorces are not in accordance with God's will. In fact, Jesus says the only real reason to give a certificate of divorce is to publicly announce that the woman has already severed the relationship through some illicit sexual activity. The word there in the Greek is porneia, which is where we get our word for pornography. So giving a certificate of divorce is just declaring publicly that this spouse has already violated the marriage covenant, broken the marriage covenant, by entering into a sexual relationship. And so, this, without this exception, Jesus says, that woman is still bound to, in God's eyes, bound to her husband. And therefore, if she goes out, leaves her husband, or is put out from her husband, and has not committed that illicit sexual act, and she ends up joining with another man, that is adultery. Jesus, again, is taking the superficial legality of the law, the way it had been interpreted by the Jews, and he's presenting it in light of what God's will and God's intent truly is. So that his disciples righteousness will surpass that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. They are to be the salt of the earth. They are to be the light of the world. Now last week, I want you to think about this, last week I mentioned the fact that the divorce rates are as high in the church today as they are among the rest of the world. And I want you to, to just think about what would happen if those who claim to be disciples of Jesus quit living by this no-fault divorce law of our world and started living according to God's will for marriage. And, and we don't like talking about divorce and remarriage in the church today because it affects so many of us in the church. And, and I would love to be able to stand up here and, and, and say something that would just lighten all of this up and make it feel a whole lot better for those of us who have lived through this. But Jesus tells us this is what God originally intended. It's what God still intends for His people. We will continue to talk about divorce and remarriage. It comes up later in Matthew's Gospel. Uh, one thing that I will tell you, because I know that there are many people in our world today who have divorced and remarried not in accordance with God's will. And that is why we need a Savior. Amen? Amen. And we do need to keep that in mind. But church, today 
from this point forward, this is what God intends of His people. And we've got to keep that in mind. doesn't matter what our world accepts, what laws we create or anything. If we are God's people on earth as it is in heaven, living God's will on earth as it is in heaven, this is what God intends. Now Jesus goes on. There's one other that I want to bring up, and that's beginning in verse 33, where He says, Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but keep the oaths you have made to the Lord. But I tell you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is His footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great King. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black, and I have come to find out you can't even make them stay in there, the ones you've got. But anyway, verse 37, simply let your yes be yes and your no, no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Oaths. Now I want to tell you right up off the bat, NIV uses the word swearing here. Swearing does not mean saying cuss words in this context. That's not what he's talking about. Now swearing does mean saying cuss words sometimes, but here that's not what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about oaths. Now, think about this. An oath assumes that the reliability of one's word is suspect unless it's accompanied by some external confirmation. Now, think about that. We have, most of us, our own way of expressing truth from what we say, or about what we say. If, if we want to make sure somebody really knows we're telling the truth, we'll say something like, I swear on my mama's grave. Any of you ever said that one? Heard it? Alright. I swear on a stack of Bibles. Any of you ever used that one? You good church folk, you've never had to use that one. If I'm lying, I'm dying. Any of you Jerry Flower fans in here? We say things to make sure that people know we're telling the truth now. Which means that if we hadn't said that, maybe we weren't, right? That's what oaths really are about. Now, some people had established a hierarchical system where, like, say, if you if you said, I swear by this dirt, that didn't carry as much weight as by saying, I swear by the river or I swear by the sky. Everything had its own level, and the more you know emphasis you put on it, the more truthful your words meant. meant. Like, uh, for instance, saying, you know, I swear on the Bible is not as serious as I swear on a stack of Bibles, right? So they had this kind of hierarchical system. Now, in some Jewish circles, to swear by heaven or earth or Jerusalem or one's head was not quite as binding of an oath as to take a pledge or an oath that invoked the name of God. So if you wanted to be truly taken for serious, and people know that your word meant exactly what you said, you would invoke the name of God. Otherwise, you would just swear by heaven or earth or Jerusalem or, one, or your own head or something. But Jesus says that everything, heaven, earth, Jerusalem, even your own head, are inseparable from God. And so to swear by anything at all, if you truly are a disciple, if you truly live in the kingdom of heaven, then everything you say, every word that comes out of your mouth, any oath that you could take, is equally binding to any that you make in the name of God. And that becomes very important to us because those of us in the kingdom, if we say yes to something that is just as binding as anything else we could have ever said. If we say no to anything, that is just as binding as if we had associated it with the name of God because we speak as His people, His will on earth as it is in heaven. And so what we say must carry the greatest significance. Now, I wanted to bring all three of these together this morning, and actually it would have been great to, to include the one that we looked at last week, but N.T. Wright, a, a scholar who's written a commentary on this, makes a good point. If we go back to what we looked at last week, last week we looked on 
uh, reconciling conflict in relationships. This week we looked at lustful looks and adultery. And I'm going to skip over divorce for a second because the other thing we looked at was oaths. And what Wright says is if the church has, has emphasized enough about reconciling conflicts and keeping our eyes where they belong and speaking truthfully, that our word means something, that maybe we wouldn't be wrestling with divorce the way we are today. And I think there's a lot of truth in that. I think if we emphasize the things that God calls us to emphasize as His body and as His church, we wouldn't be having the problems with divorce in the church that we do today. But these are some of the things that dilute our saltiness and diminish our light. You see, the world promotes not being reconciled. The world doesn't want people to work out their differences. If you're having problems in your marriage, the world says, you know what, God wants you to be happy, just leave. Grass is greener on the other side. You know what the truth is? Grass is grass regardless of which side of the fence it's on. But the world says, you know, God wants you to be happy, just leave. Our world promotes lust. And looking lustfully. Our world promotes it. And Hollywood has done everything they can to tell us that that's all okay. To be looking at other people and sleeping with other people and trying everything out. Our courts have told us that it's okay to divorce for any and every reason. Just don't get along. That's okay. You don't have to have a reason. Our world has told us that, you know, we don't really have to hold people accountable for what they say. Because after all, if they lied to us, they probably had a good reason for it. And so everything in our world dilutes our saltiness and dims our light. But God has called us to reconcile broken relationships. To keep our eyes focus where they need to be. To stick with our marriages and not divorce except for reasons of marital unfaithfulness. To be honest and trustworthy when we speak. The question for us is are we going to be controlled externally by the world or are we going to let God come into our lives and move us according to His will? Are we going to be captivated by the will of God or manipulated by the world around us? Today, I hope you have decided that it's time to leave the world and live in the kingdom. To allow God to truly become the one who captivates your inner being. And if that's where you are this morning, then I want to invite you to come to the front while we stand and sing this song.